I want to thank everybody for coming here today um, and bearing through the difficult weather. I know it wasn't easy to get here, so hopefully we, um, you can enjoy some of the information that we have for you. It's my understanding this is the first time we've had this meeting in person since COVID. So it's nice to put some faces with names. I've seen a lot of emails and hopefully I get a chance to, to meet all of you face to face and, uh, and be able to again, associate a, a face with a name. Uh, many of you are, are used to seeing Bob Wade up here. I think um, probably some of you are wishing you've seen Bob Wade up here, but um, Bob, re yeah. <laughs> well, Bob, <laughs> Bob was very experienced and um, he's left me some big shoes to fill. Um, so I, you know, I come from a little bit different background. My name is, is Dave Smith. I've been in the position um, trying to do what Bob did for about three months now. And so I've I got some very good staff that I've worked with and have helped me along. But I ask you to be patient with me. I may not have all the answers to some of the questions that you might have tonight. And uh, I promise you, if, if I don't have the answer at the tip of my tongue or, or one of my staff doesn't, then uh, we'll get you the answer within the next day or so. Um, just a couple housekeeping things to go over before we get started. There is quite a few speakers and some of them have um, a good deal of information that they want to cover tonight. So I ask that you hold your questions until the end of the presentation. If there's just a clarification thing on one of the presenters, the information that they're covering, that'd be fine. But if you have specific things that you want to address in the best interest of keeping the, the meeting, meeting moving along, um, please keep those questions till the end. I promise there'll be opportunity for Q&A at the end. Okay, um, is Beth out there? We need to start. The, we're going to start with a, a brief video from our mayor, Brian Barnett. Um, he's unable to be here tonight, but he wanted to address everybody, and so he's got a brief uh, video that we're going to get started and, uh, and let you listen to his words coming from him. Hi, I'm Brian Barnett, mayor of the city of Rochester Hills, and welcome to the Homeowners Association meeting. I apologize that I can't be with you tonight because I have a conflict with another meeting in town, but I did want to take just a moment to welcome you and mostly to thank you. Thank you for your local leadership uh, right in your own neighborhoods. This is uh, probably the most local level of leadership you can find anywhere in the country, and we appreciate all the work you do to keep your friends and neighbors informed as much as possible. I want to thank the Rochester Hills team members that are there. They've got a really full agenda of some great things uh, to update you on and, and hopefully some good back and forth conversation to improve your experience in leading your homeowners association right here in our community. Now, my update is going to be given by Tom Talbert, my senior advisor, and he's going to talk to you a little bit about the census, some really cool things happening on Auburn Road, and I'm sure someone hopefully will talk about Innovation Hills. Innovation Hills, if you haven't been there recently, is just absolutely booming with life, activity, and enjoyment. As uh, We opened up the, the uh, playground a few weeks ago and a new boardwalk path. If you haven't been there, you want to be the coolest parent or grandparent, uh, take those kids to uh, Innovation Hills and let us know what you think. Well, we've been through a lot. Uh, we've been through certainly a, a global pandemic. More recently, we've been through some historic flooding. And through all of it, hopefully you found support here at the city of Rochester Hills. We exist to make sure that your experience here uh, is as smooth as possible. We want to create the preeminent place to live, work, and raise your family, and you are a part of that journey with us. So on behalf of the mayor's office team and myself, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for being here and attending, and thank you for continuing to live and love the city of Rochester Hills. Representing our, our mayor's office today is going to be Tom Talbert. So we welcome Tom. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm Tom Talbert, the senior advisor to the mayor. And, and as the mayor mentioned in the video, thank you for being here and for all you're doing for your uh, homeowners associations and for all you do for the city. We're thankful for that. I'm going to start out by uh, talking and give you an update on the census. How many people filled out their census form last year? Hopefully a number of you did. The city was fortunate in that we had the fourth highest rate of a city our size of return rate of any city in the country of our size. So we're thankful for the participation. And participation means greater representation and the greater 
chance that we can uh, get more resources in the city. Our population went up by 7.5%. The population of the city is now 76,300. Uh, the state of Michigan grew at 2%. Oakland County grew at 6%. So we were a little higher than uh, both the state of Michigan in Oakland County. And in terms of the composition of the city, we're getting older and a little more diverse than what we were 10 years ago. So when we compare 2020 to 2010 data, and the index is simply a representation of, of 20, uh, 2020 over 2010, total population up 7.5%. White population is down. The Asian population is up dramatically, up to 15% of our population. Uh, Hispanic, black, multiracial, you see that multiracial is up, black is down a little bit. And age 65 plus, so you look at that, uh, the percentage of the population now, almost 20% is 65 plus. The median age went up also uh, about um, three percentage points, uh, now median age of 40.2. That's what the population looks like. Uh, we're really pleased at the turnout and happy to report that people love working or, or living and, and living and working here in the city. Uh, I want to address the topic of electricity. Uh, probably the biggest single question that comes into the city right now into the mayor's office is the reliability of DTE. Uh, I don't know if any of you have experienced power outages. I know certainly this year we've had a number of weather-related power outages. I think that homeowners are willing to offer DTE grace when it comes to heavy winds or snows or ice, things like that. But we've had power outage outages uh, due to what would seem to be no reason at all other than infrastructure and maybe some uh, tree trimming issues. So we have been in regular and often daily communication with DTE. They know us well. Jennifer Whitaker, our representative there, uh, and I are um, in regular contact. It's unfortunate, but I want to address that because it's been something that we're, we're saying on top of. Let me just mention a couple things. The mayor's office had a meeting with DTE officials on September 7th. We have another one scheduled for tomorrow, an update from them, where we expect to get an update on what they're planning to do in terms of infrastructure improvements in the city and other tree trimming initiatives that they have. I can tell you also from participating in a meeting with uh, County Executive Coulter on the 20th of September, there were about 65 communities in Oakland County that were part of that conversation, and every single one of them has a similar issue that we do in our city. Uh, DTE has identified 79 priority communities to receive extra attention, and Rochester Hills is one of them. Uh, Mayor Barnett has formed the City of Rochester Hills DTE Coalition, which is primarily comprised of uh, elected officials here. Uh, Representative Tisdale, Tisdell, our two uh, county uh, commissioners, uh, Kuhn and Kokendorfer, as well as uh, other people in Lansing who are going to be part of that and will keep beating the drum. Our follow-up meeting, as I mentioned, with DTE leadership is scheduled for tomorrow. We don't control them, they don't report to us, but we can advocate for citizen concerns and resident issues with regard to uh, electric reliability and we'll continue to do that. You may have seen in, in our DPS uh, department another call that comes into the, the mayor's office is about red zone uh, robotics. You may have seen uh, trucks along um, our roads. Red, red zone is a company that is doing some infrastructure inspections, so we're being proactive about inspecting the sewer lines in the city. Uh, this, their activity will go on through uh, the uh, better part the first half of next year, so they're inspecting 247 miles of aging wastewater pipeline, and uh, this inspection allows us to uh, get ahead of uh, of what we might do in terms of repairs for those uh, for those lines. And the benefit of doing this type of work now is that. Emergency repairs are really costly. Plan repairs are less expensive. And so we'll be able to stay on top of it through uh, these robots that actually travel through our sewer lines in the city. Just wanted you to be aware of that. So if you see a, a red zone logo like that, they'll also have a city of Rochester Hills logo on the truck. You'll know who those who those people are. Good news, Sunrise Pinnacle Awards were held by the Rochester Regional Chamber last week, last Friday. 
uh, two award winners from the city of Rochester Hills, Christine Wisbrun and uh, Lieutenant Ann Eccles from the fire department. So Christine won the leadership um, Greater Rochester Graduate Award and Lieutenant Eccles, the first responder of the year award. We're proud of the work that they do and this continues a long line of City of Rochester Hills employees that are honored at that annual uh, event that, that recognizes uh, greatness and, and good work of, of people in our community. Let's also give um, congratulations to incoming Rochester Regional Chamber President Maggie Bobbitts who has been a long time uh, uh, employee of, of uh, the chamber and now she'll be taking over beginning in January. We're happy for Maggie and feel that she'll do an outstanding job. We can't say enough good about her, so congratulations to Maggie. I don't know how many people may have been at the mayor's State of the City address. It's the, he gave it for the first time outside. Uh, it took place at Innovation Hills. If you weren't there in person, you might, might have seen it online. You can see it on a YouTube channel. It's also been running on our uh, cable channel, RHTV, here. It was held on uh, August 25th. And luckily, the weather held out. There are a number of events that have taken place this year where it's been a little bit uh, risky to do that, but we were really happy to do it. And the mayor mentioned Innovation Hills. I'm surprised that my entire presentation is not slides of Innovation Hills. You'll see a few of them, for sure, here, but he uh, that's a real passion of his. Uh, let me point out a couple things, uh, just a, a couple highlights from the State of the City Address. First of all, major investment in roads. Just a reminder that we know how important roads are to residents. We have been uh, on top of this through our capital improvement plan for a number of years. The last two years, we've invested 30 million total, 17 million on major roads, 13 million on local streets and neighborhoods. Our DPS group has done an outstanding job and we're proactive about, uh, about staying on top of um, uh, road improvements in the city because our survey tells us how important it is and and uh, and we've listened to that. So roads uh, have been uh, addressed. Auburn Road corridor, the mention or the mayor mentioned Auburn Road too. How many people have taken a look or been down Auburn Road lately? Let's say uh, east of John R and west of of uh, DeQuinder. Some outstanding work that's being done there and I want to showcase a little bit of that. That's the Brooklyn's neighborhood, the oldest, uh, some of the oldest homes in our city. Uh, those are before pictures. Now if you head down uh, Auburn Road, it looks like this. Uh, a median, we've trafficked, uh, the, the traffic's been calm, the parking is easier, better pedestrian access and things like that. A couple activities that took place on Auburn Road. Art on Auburn, um, I left a, a flyer out in the, in the hallway. We coordinated with Pan Creek Center for the Arts and our local school system. There are 25 different pieces of art that are actually affixed to the asphalt on along Auburn Road. An outstanding, really great program that we initiated uh, with the school system and Pan Creek Center for the Arts. And so that uh, we unveiled that that art in June, the same time we introduced the city's new splash pad, which if you haven't seen that, you'll see that at Brooklyn's Plaza, also on Auburn Road. We've called it the summer of fun. A lot of improvements uh, that have taken place there. Johnny Black's has completely redone uh, their facility and we're seeing a lot of really outstanding growth. Here's a picture of the splash pad. Um, We've also seen development, so a development in this area where we haven't seen development in, uh, in decades. This is a three-story mixed-use uh, development that's been approved by the Planning Commission. It'll be, uh, as I said, three stories, 10 residential units on the second and third floor, retail on the first floor. It's currently called Zenet Plaza. Uh, and the investment that we've made in Auburn Road has paid, uh, has paid off according to our assessing department. Um, that area of our city is growing in terms of annual increase in property values at 8%, which is 40% higher than the uh, city as a whole over the last two years. So that, uh, that area is seeing above average uh, increase in property values. So we're happy to see that investment play, pay off. The other thing that's happened as a result is this, this project was submitted to the Michigan Municipal League as, uh, uh, and we put it up for a Community Excellence Award, the project of the year, and we won. So to my left, you can see this 
uh, giant trophy that will stay in the city for a year. This is recognition for the most creative and uh, most outstanding project as recognized uh, by the Michigan Municipal League of any project in, in, in the state. So we just won that award last month and, and we're thankful for all of the teams who were involved in making that a re reality. So congratulations to everybody because now that trophy sits in our, uh, in our city for the next year. Let me mention a couple other things. Economic development, commercial vacancy rate, pre-COVID was 4% uh, after uh, currently it's, uh, or, um, currently it's 5%. Uh, we're feeling really quite good about that. I mean, we, we like our commercial vacancy rate to be as low as possible, but some might think that it would be much higher. We're happy that it's as low as it is. Unemployment in the city right now is at 2.3% compared to 4.7% in Michigan and 5.2% in the U.S. So uh, we're, we're also uh, happy that people are, are finding work. Let me uh, 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 finish my comments tonight to talk about Innovation Hills. Uh, if you haven't been to Innovation Hills, please uh, head out there. It's on um, Hamlin Road between uh, Adams Road and Crooks Road, the north side of the street, formerly um, uh, this, the new for first new park development in the city in 25 years. The Oakland Press has called it a park for a new generation, and there's a reason for that. Um, uh, new ponds went in a couple years ago. We're about uh, now almost four phases into a six-phase project. Uh, Glow-in-the-dark pathways, uh, the only place in, in Michigan and the Midwest you'll find something like that. So head out after dark and you'll see that. The boardwalk system the, men, the, the mayor mentioned in his comments has just been expanded. So we just opened what we're calling the South Loop, the loop that's closest to Hamlin Road. Now we've got about a mile and a half Ken Elward, is that of, of Boardwalk? Really spectacular um, uh, Boardwalk. And then the playground just opened about uh, two, a month and a half ago. So Innovation Hills Playground, which had been, um, uh, been uh, under development for a little over a year, we opened it up and it has been un incredibly popular. In fact, so popular that we've run out of uh, parking and so uh, there's parking across the street right now but really really um, outstanding reviews um, can't say enough good about it uh, in terms of not only the response but also the uh, the number of residents who have gone out there so you can see this is a three-story treehouse that's one of the hallmarks of the of the park and um, Ken Elwert and his team have done an outstanding job. We're really thrilled with everything that's going on at Innovation Hills. A couple more things. The mayor has a podcast. He, he started it this year. It's called Right Down the Street. It's available wherever podcasts are, uh, where you don't download your podcasts. We started with Pastor Chris Brooks from Woodside. We've interviewed Frank Beckman, Imam Ale Lila, uh, and a number of other guests. Fiona Turret is a really was a really interesting guest, a native of Rochester Hills, who's now one of 10 new flight directors at NASA. She controls, um, I think uh, most of us think of our jobs as being important or our roles as being important. She's only responsible for all human uh, activity in space from, uh, for, the, uh, for NASA. Brad Keselowski, we know him, and Dr. Peskovitz from Oakland University and, and County Executive Dave, Dave Coulter was the last person that the mayor interviewed. One more thing, don't forget to vote on November 2nd. I think our Parks Department will probably talk about this, but we uh, are looking to repurpose expired OPC millage to improve and enhance our city city's parks. The OPC millage will expire. Uh, if you vote yes on this proposal, uh, it will uh, not increase uh, tax rate. We're, we're looking to re repurpose that for renovation, replacement of new parks projects in the cities. We've got about $10 million uh, in old parks programs that have not, uh, projects that have not taken place. Um, one other thing that I'll, I'll say about this is that this, this does not affect funding for the OPC. The budget for the OPC is funded separate from uh, the, the building millage that is now has been paid off. So the good news is for OPC, their building and the property that was uh, that we've been paying for for some time, Oakland Township, City of Rochester, and Rochester Hills have been paying for. It's um, paid off. And that's it. Thank you for all you do, and thank you for listening to uh, 
comments from the mayor's office. Can I answer any questions for anyone? Tom. I'm not going to be the person who can ans answer that question, but I, I see someone who, who might be able to re re repeat the question. So, Tom, you're wondering about the wastewater system. Can, sur sorry, surface water drainage system could be inspected by uh, an outfit like Red Zone. Evening, everyone. My name is Paul Davis. I'm the city engineer. I'm one of the presenters that are scheduled for a couple topics from now. But I'm also involved in the Red Zone uh, initiative. It, it's a deep Department of Public Services project that's going forward. And I probably need to make a distinction. You know, the Red Zone uh, project is to go through sanitary sewer systems, your wastewater systems. Um, we have uh, it, about $2.6 million that is going to be used to get into some of the sewers where we have not been able to get our heavy equipment to televise them for many years. Um, this particular company has a number of robots that they're able to send into the sewers and record video information, different than what we have from our large sewer truck that has a camera associated with it. So um, this is not being used for stormwater. Um, sewer or storm sewer uh, lines. Those lines are generally much bigger and uh, like you've said, the city doesn't own all the storm sewer systems. A lot of times the homeowner associations own those. Uh, I'd like to cut you a deal, but we can't. I mean, this is a, a, a private company that responded to a solicitation for the city and uh, I don't think we're able to extend that type of pricing for the, the subdivisions. But having said that, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad you're bringing this up because it's important. You know, a lot of times I've, I've been here, it's been a while since I gave one of these presentations, but the last one I did was about detention systems and stormwater systems and the ownership. A lot of homeowner associations don't realize they have responsibility for their storm sewer lines. The city doesn't own that all the storm sewer lines like we do water main and sanitary sewer. Those are enterprise funds. The users that connect to those systems pay water and sewage rates to maintain those. The city has a revenue source for that. Stormwater is different. It's, it's not set up that way. There's very few communities that have a, a, a system set up similar to a water or sanitary system where they can collect monies and be responsible for the whole system. It would be nice if it was um, like that in Rochester Hills or even throughout the state, but because of um, some taxing limitations and headly requirements, it's just a difficult thing to, uh, to set up in this state. So yeah, we're, we're not volunteering to do these because we don't really have the money, the staffing, the equipment, and, and the resources necessary to handle all the storm sewer systems. So unfortunately, the homeowner associations are responsible for a lot of those lines. If we want to get more specific, I can kind of schedule a, an appointment to meet with anyone here tonight and kind of further explain it. You know, my presentation is kind of a little higher level, but if it's something specific to an individual subdivision, I'd be happy to meet with people and um, go over their individual systems and kind of explain, um, I, I guess, you know, a lot of times they have unique characteristics or, or different sizes and, and we can go over that. But basically, a lot of it comes down to um, how the systems were originally designed and what design criteria there was. Uh, whether you're on board with climate change or changing conditions, it, it, it does seem like we're getting more intense storms and, and maybe more frequently too. And these systems were designed with maybe a, a, a lesser design criteria than what we're starting to see. Um, over the years, agencies keep track of rainfall data and sometimes the design criteria is revised based on that. That's gonna be in part of my presentation what I'll talk about. But um, for what homeowner associations can do is basically what we do. You can look at your detention basin and make sure that the outlet is open. Sometimes during big design or big rain events, um, a lot of woody debris might be carried or leaves and sticks carried in and they'll block your openings and cause 
flooding of your detention basin. They might get into the storm sewer system also. You might have to periodically televise the storm sewer system and, and see if you have the same capacity in the pipe or if there's blockages in there that are unknown. So there is some level of maintenance that should be done by the homeowner associations, but I don't think, you know, a lot of times that's done. And it could be because sometimes the personnel that are the leaders of the associations cycle, that they're, they're not there. That someone that might have heard me talk about this, say, seven or eight years ago, is no longer involved with the HOA, and it's a new person that hasn't had heard this discussion yet. Um, but we're here to try and help assist and educate. Hopefully that answers it. If, if not, then I'd, I'd like to get your name and maybe we can schedule an appointment to review your particular concern. Thank you. Any, any other questions for the... No, go ahead. No? Okay. All right. Quick. Yep. We can we can find out about that. I I don't know if it's prohibited right now, but uh, that's certainly something we could we could talk about. Sure. The question was, can subdivisions put art on their on their roads? Com comments. We can find out about that. Yes, sir. It's called Legacy. You're talking, yeah, Adams and Hamlin in the northeast corner. Yeah, the leg, Legacy, that's uh, luxury apartments, about 300 uh, and so, 330, I want to say, something like that. No. No. No, that's a project that's a, 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 a previously a brownfield. You might know there's some history with that. The, the current developer has cleaned that up, and now they're in, the clean the cleanup took about a year, I would say. Now they're in the process of building that you've seen. Any other questions? Thank you for your time tonight. All right, our, our next speaker is from the Rochester Pollinators Group. Uh, she's going to be speaking on native plants and butterflies. Please uh, welcome Marilyn Trent. Hi, um, I want to thank the administration for allowing me to speak today about my favorite subject this evening, uh, butterfly gardening and uh, how to save the monarch butterfly and more. So I'm Marilyn Trent, um, the founder of the Rochester Pollinators, and our original mission was to save the monarch butterfly because um, the population had experienced a 90% in decline depending upon the year. So I learned that it was because of the lack of Michigan native plants and then discovered how valuable um, and beneficial all Michigan native plants, trees and shrubs are and our mission expanded. I was asked to present to this group because some of you manage a lot of landscaping and you've already mentioned the stormwater issues and the addition, uh, additional rain and, and, and uh, that is happening. And all of you have yards. So maybe your common areas could benefit from less mowing and your entrances could use less water and maintenance, which reduces landscaping costs. You may have areas that experience more flooding when it rains. So Michigan native plants, rain gardens, and bioswells can remedy these issues. So what's happening besides the monarch butterfly decline? 40% of our pollinators are in decline as well, and a third of our food supply is dependent upon pollination. And then I found out, and you may have heard also, that three billion birds have disappeared in the process, and this is all interconnected. Our pollinators feed us by keeping our food web healthy. So 90% of all flowering plants including many fruits and vegetable plants, benefit from pollinators. So many of our favorite foods would totally disappear or be extremely rare 
and become expensive. Now, all of these foods are not uh, grown around this area, um, but avocados, cherries, and tequila, and coffee, and wine, and our apple pie, our lemonade, our raspberries, and almonds, and things that we really like need pollinators. And unless we want to become human pollinators or create a new job with paintbrushes and trying to pollinate ourselves, it is very intense to do that, and they have a they do have that going on in China. Let's try to save our pollinators. It seems so much simpler. Um, this is an ecologically, uh, oops, sorry, I missed a slide. Oh, here it is. Um, yes. So pollinators are being threatened by a number of factors. We mentioned habitat loss. Over 40 million acres have been altered, and the increased use of pesticides and herbicides and new diseases have increased their decline. This is an ecologically solvable problem each one of us can do in our own backyard or front yard by integrating Michigan native plants into our landscaping. It's pure Michigan, but you need to make sure they're Michigan native plants and not imposters. Okay, so it's the gift that keeps on giving. From this chart, you can see the difference. Non-native plants, which includes turf grass on the left side of this chart, uh, have shorter roots, so they need more water, they need more fertilizer, and can cause more soil compaction. And then the lovely plants on the right, the native plants with the longer roots, sometimes up to 15 feet, they filter and they clean the toxins in the water, they retain the water so there's less flooding and less water going into our storm drains. They also save you time and money because perennials grow back each year and Michigan native plants are hardy perennials. They need no herbicides and pesticides and if you replace them in your, with, for your grass, they need, you spend less time mowing and they are beautiful. They are like true Michiganders. Overwintering makes them stronger and better as we prepare for winter. <laughs> so who are we trying to save? Or what are we trying to save? Butterflies, besides the butterflies, there's hummingbirds, there's native bees, dragonflies, and katydids, and praying mantises, and more that are pollinators. There are, mutter, there, oh, sorry, there are Michigan has 400, 50 species of native birds. We have 469 native butterflies and moths and 450 native bees. The native plants feed the butterflies and bee bees in the summer months and in the winter months, the seeds heads that are left feed the birds, the ones that don't migrate. So, yes, this planting Michigan native plants does follow the city of Rochester Hills lawn ordinances. The misunderstanding is that native plants are not weeds, but are flowers. So they do, so they can have the same height requirements as flowers. We're not saying to replace all your flowers, but we're asking you to add or integrate them into your current landscaping. You have common areas and entrance that the entrances that the plants can be added to. Native plants, like I said, are beautiful flowers. Uh, here's some that, on this slide. Um, so don't let their names fool you. Uh, as many of the, them have the word weed in them. Joe pie weed, sneeze weed, that's a hard sell. So we call it helenium, the Latin name, pickerel weed and milkweed to name a few. And just to go back to sneeze weed, they used it for snuff. It doesn't really make you sneeze until, unless you make snuff or use snuff, which I doubt very many people do. Um, so once you see how easy they are to take care of, you can sit back and enjoy nature and its many benefits in your butterfly garden. The other thing that we're asking you to do is something very innovative, kind of like Apple did years ago about thinking different. We're asking you to take a look at this weed that you may be going along Paint Creek Trail and you might see a cone flower or you might see a Joe Pye weed, maybe you don't know what it is, but it's there. Um, and you might see some uh, black-eyed Susans. And what we're saying is if once you put them into your garden, they can be well behaved and they do get along with others and you just don't think of them as a weed anymore, they become a flower. So it's like Shakespeare said, a rose is a rose by any other, uh, any other name. Um, 
So, Rochester Hills has many native plants in their public spaces because they are no strangers to the benefits and the beauty of native plants. And so this is just a few, and you, you know about Innovation Hills, but they have a lot of Michigan native plants in them. And your mayor committed, is committed to saving the, mutter, the monarch butterfly as he signed the mayor's monarch pledge last year and has 28 actions to save the monarch, monarch butterfly and that is planting native plants in public spaces. So he did, they've done that. I have a full list on our website at rochesterpollinators.org. There's a lot of um, public spaces that have Michigan native plants in them. So last but not least, um, I am a lazy gardener. I don't like to plant new plants each year. I don't like watering my garden. I don't like it when plants die, but I do love flowers and butterflies. You can find lots of information at rochesterpollinators.org. I have a lovely little brochure that makes it very easy to find us. It has the 12, top 12, easy to get along garden variety Michigan native plants. So email us, we are pollinators at trentcreative.com if you have any questions or you want to know anything about planting more gardens. We have a lot of native plant sales and on our website we have the places you can buy them at Michigan uh, nurseries. So um, I have lo I, this is my side job. I am a marketing company and we are marketing for uh, saving the butterfly and also integrating these plants into your landscapes. That's it. Uh, yes. Yes, that's what a lot of them came from. Yes, and that's where I saw vegetation management <laughs> in maintaining your detention pond. Yes. Yeah, we do have a deer resistant list. I sh I, we should upload it on our website, but yes, there is deer resistant. The problem is with these plants and many of them, at the smaller size, the deer will chomp them down. Some of them what we call deer resistant and the ironweed, lovely name, but it is, like I said, a pretty plant, is the one that I read was the most deer resistant. But many of them as they grow larger, they are. Yeah, not all of them though. Yes. You know, you know, um, we may have one in the city of Rochester, but I'm not sure. This is a really a new thing for homeowners associations. Ask Ken Elwerk. I I don't know. Do you know of any? Um, he asked if there were any. Uh, homeowners Association uh, subdivisions that have integrated these plants into their um, landscaping. The Fragmines, yeah. There, there is a distinction between these plants that I have in the brochure and some others and the prairie remnants and the prairie restorations because it's a lot of time, and the bioswells and the rain gardens because you can put in a, half a field or half a field of these plants pretty easily and quickly by seeds and the others are done by plugs. So yeah, I mean, all this information, we are a resource, you can email me and we'll find you the information you need and the places that uh, to, to, we wanna help everyone um, figure out how to do this the best way and enjoy um, the butterflies coming back and your other insects. I mean, I never thought I missed the bugs, but I've noticed going on to, on the, when you're driving, I no longer see them, so I'm concerned. Thank you. Is that it? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. I have to apologize again. We have a little bit of false advertising here. So Alyssa um, intended to be here. She ended up having a, a scheduling conflict, and so she won't be joining us today. If you're unfamiliar with the Recycle Bank Rewards Program, um, it's an opportunity where if you recycle, you can earn points, and those points can be used uh, towards some local um, vendors and, and uh, businesses that you can uh, use their services in exchange for those points. 
Uh, if you're already a member, I know there's been some difficulties with um, re gaining some of those uh, the points that you have or utilizing those points. Um, Alyssa is aware of that too, and so they've been working towards resolving those issues. Uh, if you're interested in signing up uh, for the Recycle Bank, go to RecycleBank.com. That is the website where you can participate in it. Um, and I think we have a slide up there for context for Alyssa also. Uh, next on our speaker list here is going to be uh, Paul Davis from our DPS and engineering. He's going to talk some more about some of the storm water issues that you've already had questions about, snow removal and flooding. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, everyone. Um, I've had the privilege to work as your city engineer for 21 years. And uh, during that time, I've got involved in a lot of topics for the Department of Public Services. So generally, this type of meeting, I'm open to whatever uh, topic the, the group would like to have me go over. And what I was told was there's two topics. Uh, one is flooding in Rochester Hills, stormwater related. And the second's uh, winter maintenance. So I'm going to go over both those tonight. I'm going to start with a uh, stormwater system design just to try and give some general information about how these systems are designed, what their limitations might be, and and kind of what I'll start with is design storms that are used to uh, design storm sewer pipes and detention basins really are, are um, the result of two different criteria. The pipes are sized to handle a peak stormwater rate, and the basins are designed to handle a volume. And when I um, talk about rain events, um, and, and in particular the design rain events, I want to focus on um, the fact that all rain events are, are unique. You know, if um, I appeared a little nervous tonight, it's probably due to the fact because when you were all walking in from the parking lot, it was raining like crazy. And every time it rains like crazy, DPS gets a little nervous because we're not sure exactly what effect it's going to have on the system. Um, and and um, But rain events can be very intense for a short period of time or they can be prolonged and they may cause different types of problems based on the type of rain event it is. Um, these rain events are monitored through the Oakland County Water Resources Commission. There's a network of 27 rain gauges spread throughout the um, county, and two of them are in Rochester Hills. We have one up by fire station number five at Tinkin and just east of Rochester Road, and we have another one kind of in the southwest part of the city by our Grant Pump Station, which is um, off Grant Street, north of Auburn, west of Crooks. And that information is important because it kind of gives us an idea of what's happening right in our community. Um, and, and rains can vary pretty dramatically even between communities or within a community. We can have uh, it rain very hard in the south part of the city and, and hardly at all in the north part and vice versa. And that will you know, be an indication of how the city's system is going to um, dictate on how we respond to complaints. We, we after a storm events, DPS generally responds to a number of drainage complaints. Sometimes they're just individual ones where a single home might be flooded. Other times they're very large regional ones. And uh, so I wanted to kind of provide a little bit more detail on like a design storm. Design storms can be looked at in terms of rate or in terms of volume. Uh, you may hear the term a 100-year storm event. And um, for when they mention that in terms of a rate, they're talking about a storm that provides 2.4 inches of rain in one hour. That's a pretty intense event. Um, but even like if you go further north in Michigan, that'll be less. And if you went further south in the country, those, those intensity events for a 100-year storm will increase. So it, it kind of varies, and it's important regionally. Um, but for a volume, 
uh, for a 100-year event, it's 5.5 inches of rain in 24-hour period. You could have a lot of that rain in 24 hours occur in just a few hours, or you could have it kind of spread out, and that type of storm where it is spread out is easier for our system to handle. Um, one of the uh, um, things that has recently occurred is the Oakland County Water Resources Commission has updated their stormwater standards. It's something the city is gonna look into adopting, whether we wanna do that. But for many years, um, Oakland County has kind of set the criteria for how we design detention basin sizes. How large do you build the basin? And it's been based on a method that was put together by an engineer at Oakland County. And I, you know, I started working in like 1987 and that formula was used from 1987 till just about now, probably when they're gonna start switching it. It was based on a 10 year storm design. So most of the uh, basins in Rochester Hills were based on a 10 year storm, something smaller than the 100 year numbers I just gave you for volume and, and for the, the pipe sizes. We um, probably, I don't know, maybe like eight or 10 years ago, switched to a 25 year event. So new developments we were requiring to build their detention basins on a larger event that would hold a 25 year storm volume. Uh, there are communities in Oakland County and uh, the Water Resources Commission itself, they, they have designed basins on a 100 year event. A lot of times I use the term competing interests and um, it would be great to say, well, we're gonna start requiring 100 year detention basins. But when you look at a site that's developing, what that means is it's gonna be potentially less area for the development to occur because they're gonna to have to accommodate for this basin design or it's gonna be more expensive to build this basin design. So a lot of times in, in DPS, we're, we're competing with balances on uh, these competing interests. So we're gonna be looking at probably adopting what we think is, is um, good for the Oakland County standards coming up, um, but maybe not all of it, but they're pretty recent. They're just now being brought out to the, some of the communities and it's a different way of doing detention. We're mostly built out, so it might not affect us a whole lot, but um, it will guide how we handle things in the future. So I thought I would then go over typical causes of flooding. One, certainly a, a rainfall that exceeds the design criteria will likely cause flooding. And we get those rainfalls. Um, back in uh, 1986, I was still at Michigan State, but I remember this storm quite a bit because there was tremendous flooding on campus. I mean, it was just uh, you know, a tremendous storm. We might have had one here recently, just within the last week or two, um, but that storm was eight inches of rainfall. You cannot expect these systems that are based on 10 year uh, design, certainly you know, even a system on a 100 year design may have difficulties and have widespread flooding when you get eight inches of rain when the 100 year rainfall is five and a half inches of rain. Now could the city try and design for the you know, once in a, uh, a millennium rain event? We could, but it comes at the, at the cost of dollars and it would be so expensive to design for that. It would, um, you know, it would be an imbalance basically. And it, so most of the communities in the past elected to design for 10 year events, but then that kind of has increased and that trend may continue. Another typical cause of flooding is vegetation covering the structure inlets. We've, um, you know, get a lot of these type of events when the, especially when there's inline basins with larger upstream drainage streams. We have some of those basins in the community and what happens is leaves and twigs may, um, during a powerful storm, be carried down into a detention basin that only has a single outlet to empty the basin. And a lot of times these covers get filled and plugged. Uh, if you drive down Butler Road, I just walked it on Monday, and you would see that a lot of the covers there were just packed with leaves and some of the walnuts that were falling. And it's, it's a continual maintenance item to make sure those things are open and available for the inlet capacity on when these big storms come. The same can be true during the storm though. Sometimes people have to go out and remove debris during the storm to allow those inlets to function. And that may be a cause of flooding. 
Uh, you may have heard the Great Lakes Water Authority. They had some bad publicity and it was due to a pumping station that had a number of pumps that were inoperable. And, and then significant flooding occurred uh, along roadways and in homes. And um, we, we have a, a place in the city where DPS has assisted um, a industrial subdivision because their pumps have uh, failed in the past. And, and we have some emergency equipment that can help them pro, um, respond to a, a, a failure like that. A restriction existing in the storm sewer pipe it's, it's important to kind of know the integrity of your system. These things a lot of times are underground, they're out of sight, out of mind, and they can accumulate significant amounts of sediment or um, other obstructions which will impact the capacity and the ability of the pipes to transfer the stormwater. And then here's one that many times people are upset with, but with new developments, again, it's a competing interest. The Oakland County Water Resources Commission will issue a permit for soil erosion. When a new site gets disturbed, it's got a lot of um, earth and potential for some of that disturbed earth to be carried into the storm sewer system, carry on downstream into the receiving streams. And that, that you know, we want to try and avoid that. So a lot of times these there will be um, silt sacks that are placed in catch basins that collect the water drainage at low points, or you may see some black fabric sticking out of a storm sewer structure. That's great, they function great. They stop all this sediment from going into the system and down downstream, but it a lot of times comes at the expense of localized flooding. And a lot of times on these big events, we might have to go out and poke holes in there and um, try and alleviate some of the flooding. So, uh, but there's, there's a reason, the reason for them being there in the first place is the soil erosion. I'll mention one last piece of advice. I don't, I don't imagine this happens too often, but there was one instance where, again, a good Samaritan um, tried to relieve some flooding that was occurring on a city street, and they saw a, uh, a manhole lid, and it was a solid cover, but they lifted it up and opened it anyhow. Well, it was a sanitary sewer manhole, and what it did is it allowed all this ponded stormwater to go into the sanitary sewer system, which was, the pipes are much smaller, generally in a sanitary system compared to storm, and it flooded out some basements. And, you know, that's, first of all, it's dangerous. You could get, lose your balance and get sucked into the manhole, but second of all, um, it caused some flooding in the neighbors, and I'm, I'm sure that person didn't feel very well after that. So next I'll go into the winter maintenance policy. Rochester Hills um, has two conditions. They're, they're, they're very similar, but it, but the, the difference is in how much time we'll spend and crew um, during overtime. Uh, the category one snowfall, uh, we have 52.8 miles of major roads that we're responsible for. And we also um, will plow those on seven days a week as needed, 24 hour basis. And then we will, um, on the local roads, get to them as, as we can during normal working hours. In a category two, which is defined as a snowfall four inches or more, we will get into the local roads and we'll plow those on overtime. And a lot of times our employees that are doing the plowing, they'll work 16 hours straight on this and then they're by law uh, mandatory, they have to take a break and recover somewhat and then they can come back. But we have a dedicated group and we try and keep people on the same routes for efficiency. And uh, I think for the most part we do um, a good job trying to handle all the major roads um, when necessary and then get into the local roads. But like similar to rain events, snowfall events are are all different too. Sometimes they have ice attributed to them, which we will have to apply de-icing. Um, we might have to uh, do more salting. Uh, it might be a heavier snow that's tougher on the equipment. So what we do is our department management uses, uh, they make adjustments during every one of the snowfall events and use their best judgment at, for the priorities on, on how the, each event should be handled. Um, a lot of times we might have some emergency assistance that's provided. Crittenden Hospital is, is a primary and, and very important part in the community. 
So as a result, Rochester Hills maintains Livernois Road. It's not a road we even own, but we have um, taken that ownership over from the road commission during the winter maintenance months so that we can make sure that uh, Livernois Road is gonna be plowed and available and we can direct staff as needed if, if say uh, an ambulance needs to get to Livernois Road and it's not in the best condition. School routes are another um, important area. One of the things I would like to mention is if you go to the city's website at rochesterhills.org, you can go into the Department of Public Services page, but there's also another area where you can go into that's uh, titled maps. And there's a lot of kind of useful maps, uh, informative ones that you can look at. You can see the primary routes where we try and plow and they'll be highlighted in purple for the city's lines, but they're generally uh, major collector streets in subdivisions, like say Grandview, uh, Charlwood, Raintree, Powderhorn, those are streets that um, serve a lot of people within a subdivision. And then there's uh, other routes like the major roads, the mile roads, um, some of them we own, some of them the road commission owns. So sometimes during a big snowfall, the mayor needs to declare a, a winter maintenance emergency. And uh, generally that's advertised. And what that means is basically in order for our employees to plow these streets efficiently, we need to have the vehicles removed from them. We, it, it's, we don't want to have to go around vehicles, block vehicles in with big snowfall um, uh, deposits. Uh, so a winter maintenance emergency could be um, given by the mayor. If you sign up for the alerts system that uh, RH Connect that the city has, you might be notified of those uh, emergencies or you can see it on our website. Yes, you had a question? For the winter maintenance emergency? Yes, it certainly does. Well, I th our policy, which I'm just providing some information on the policy, you can see the entire policy from the website. Uh, which goes into more detail. But our goal is to have the city entirely plowed, including all the local streets within four days. Um, many times we're able to exceed that. Um, I think last year we were able to many times have everything plowed within a day and a half or two days. But again, it depends on the snowfall. If we get a dozen inches of snow and, it, it, and it's you know much harder to respond to that if it's continuous and we have to stay on the major roads, it might prolong our ability to get into the local roads. So um, here's some areas where the snow emergency notifications will be uh, listed. Rochester Hills Television and website, uh, our Instagram, you know, our social media sites, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, local television and radio may announce it. and. Um, like I said, the RH Connect on the city website is something you could sign up for for alerts. One last thing I thought I'd mention is if you're curious enough to want to see how the operation is going in real time, we do have an option which kind of shows where our plows are during snow events. And if you went to rochesterhills.plowtracker.com, you can see our, our fleet and, and where plows are going and, and how they're tackling the, uh, within the subdivisions or major roads during the event. With that, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. All right, from our Parks and Natural Resources Department, we have Director Ken Elward. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm just gonna be real brief, and thanks, Dave, for sort of 
sliding me in in between our, um, our forestry department here that you'll be hearing from Jerry Pink in just a minute. Um, again, my name's Ken Auer with the Parks and Natural Resources Department, and I just want to talk briefly, you heard a little bit about it from Tom, but briefly about the uh, parks proposal that is, that is on the ballot on November 2nd. And I um, just want to encourage you in general to just go vote. There is also one local race that is um, contested as well. And so I encourage you to get an absentee ballot or, or vote in person. Um, you still have several weeks to do that. So briefly, just so you understand sort of how this affects the department as a whole, um, our, our department consists of four divisions. We have grounds maintenance, which actually maintains the um, Auburn Road corridor, the vegetation, the, uh, the traffic rotaries that you see around, and essentially a vegetation around like that area. Um, we also have the Van Heusen Museum um, that, that is underneath this department, as well as parks. We have about 1,100 acres, as well as the Clinton River Trail and the Paint Creek Trail that uh, we also maintain for your use, and of course, natural resources, of which you'll hear um, from Jerry Pink in just a few minutes, that has forestry, our outdoor programs, as well as um, some other favorite topics like wildlife and deer, for instance, that we, uh, um, we, we deal with on that. So overall, I've already mentioned we have acre, you know, quite a bit of acreage, but we provide services for over a million people every year. A million visitors come to the parks, and, and we can back that up with our traffic counts and, and the numbers of walkers um, very easily. The forestry department manages, or division manages, 20,000 trees in the city, and um, we have tens of thousands of program visitors. So this is what we talk about when, when you'll see this um, proposal for a parks um, basically repurposed OPC millage. Um, just a couple quick questions um, on this millage, and I have this information will be av available for you at the back table if you haven't received it yet. Is this a new tax? No. Um, what we're proposing is that the, um, the current millage for um, the OPC building is expiring because the building is paid off. Um, so we are proposing to use that for capital funds only um, for the parks department. So that involves things like replacing um, parking lots, and there's over $10 million worth of projects in the next five years um, that we're looking at. Parking lots and restrooms and renovating basketball courts and building new tennis courts and turning them into pickleball courts, which we're planning to, to uh, um, move forward with as well, as well as resurface things and, and uh, some new possibilities as well. Um, so again, it is only reserved for facilities. It can't be used for operations. It can't be used for staffing. It can also be used for the museum. Quick question, yeah. Nowicki on Adams Road, certainly. Um, Nowicki's on the list in our capital improvement plan, and um, that's sort of the next park that we're looking at as to what to do with, and you'll actually hear in the next six months or so from, um, we're going to be asking the residents to guide our master plan for the next five years on that as, as to what you're looking for on that, but it, it is in the, the current city's capital improvement plan as a pending project. No specific, no specific are we doing a playground or a community garden or trails or anything. But uh, um, this funding isn't specifically reserved for that. Essentially, we have ten thousand or ten million dollars worth of worth of concepts, and as the new concepts come up, this could go towards that. Yeah, it's, it's not a tra trail, it's a temporary road um, that, that, that we're actually working with the DPS department. Um, we're filling some, some low areas essentially would have been difficult to walk through, but they also have a substantial amount of soil that they're filling up. It's gonna be all planted with, you heard from Marilyn earlier, we're gonna be planting it with native species of plants where we can on that. So it looks bad now, but it's, it's going back to, after they get the soil in to that area, it's going back to essentially natural. Um, and so, you know, we've had the question, why is it needed? And I just want to point out, you know, our oldest park was built in 1924, Bloomer Park. We didn't own it then, but we're certainly maintaining it. And so we have crumbling parking lots there. We have very old restrooms there. All of our parks are, other than Innovation Hills, all of our parks have been 
built over 20, 25 years ago. And so we have this massive infrastructure problem which we're just starting to see. So, so this, this millage would essentially help um, a deal with that. And you know, the city council has been very generous in how they've supported and, and built these projects overall, but, but we're behind now and we're asking for you to consider this in the, in the future. So that's all I had and I'm gonna just ask briefly if there's any specific questions, otherwise hand it over to uh, Jerry Pink. Um, we try to collect um, the, the uh, parking fees during the, you know, the high volume times. There were certainly challenges with seasonal staff um, this year. And so typically during the summer, we're out there almost all the time. And then the shoulder seasons of sort of the May, um, May, September, we go there during vo basically higher volume visitation times on that. But no, the, the plan right now is to continue, um, continue collecting. Um, as of now, um, there are no plans for that. That's not to say that we won't consider that in the future. Uh, when Bloomer Park started in 1924, and I won't go into the long history of Bloomer Park, but it was a state park. And so there were, there were collections and, and things at that point. Um, the, the trend in the 60s and 70s and 80s was to collect money for parking, but not collect for entrance fees. And actually, um, it was before my time here with the city, but they continued that policy um, there. And it's, it's sort of a demand feature too at that point. My understanding is when we took it over from the city that there were all kinds of problems with, I won't say um, undesirables, but vandalism and lots of things happening in the woods and problems. So they instituted some of that to control some of that as well. Um, again, 30 years ago, um, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Um, but uh, we're, we're looking at that actually all those elements in an operations plan that we're looking at over the next six months as to where it makes sense to charge or not. And there are some different philosophies for that as to whether you charge for individual programs or entrance to parks and things like that. So was that answered enough for you? So, so the, yeah, the, okay. Anything else? Okay, thank you very much. I'll offer up here Jerry Pink and he's gonna talk quite a bit about uh, our forestry departments and uh, the programs that they're offered. So. Oh. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Jerry Pink. I am standing in for Matt Einhauser. I'm the lead arborist for the Parks and Natural Resources uh, Department. Matt promised there'd be beer and pretzels tonight and um, I got excited seeing the gold cup here, but there are no beer and pretzels, so I'm gonna have to talk to Matt about filling in for him next time. The city has two programs for tree planting. Um, the free street tree planting program is a program that we've been doing for over 30 years. We plant a two inch caliper, eight to 10 foot tall, bald and burlapped tree in the city right of way in front of uh, homes and, and, and uh, um, HOA property in the right of way and throughout the city, provided it doesn't have any conflicts with utilities, uh, infrastructure, sight lines, and such like that. Um, you call us up and the planting orders have to be in by March for the spring program, which is coming up. That, and uh, that one's already, we've already ordered the trees. So this fall one, you'll want that order in by September, beginning of September. The second program is our community canopy program. Now this program is, um, allows the planting of trees on private property. And it's run through the Arbor Day uh, Foundation. And you can access it through the city's website. And it's kind of a cool program. And you can actually place the tree on your private property to maximize where you'll get the most energy efficient use of that shade tree once it's planted. Most of them I think are native, um, and, but they are considerably smaller. They're only two to eight feet, or two to, two to four feet tall. But um, that's what we offer for private residents. Um, and, and then of course, go to the website for that one. Tree planting, tree removal permits. Tree planting, you are supposed to get a permit to 
plant a tree on city property, on the city right of way, we want to make sure it's not going to have an infrastructure conflict or a sight line conflict. And it's an appropriate species for the location, meaning we don't want a short growing, wide growing tree in between the street and the road where we'll constantly have to elevate it to keep it out of the road and out of the sidewalk. Um, but most of our questions are regarding tree removal and the city uh, for tree removal permits, you need a permit to remove any tree from the city right of way. And if you have a tree on the city right of way that you'd like removed, ask us to come out and take a look at it or send me a picture to my email. And sometimes it can be very uh, quickly resolved. If it's a tree that we agree is in need of removal, has hazard problems, um, dead or dying, um, and by our definition of dead and dying and not just it looks bad, um, then we may agree to remove it and put it on our list to remove, uh, either by our in-house crews or our contractor. If we disagree that the city needs to remove it and you want to remove it for any number of reasons, then you have to take out a $50 permit free generally to remove the tree. You may be required to replace the tree. The private tree removal is another one, and that's for any regulated tree, which is tree six inches in diameter, which is here to me, probably here for most people. Um, six inches in diameter at breast height is a regulated tree, and um, this would be on any private property. You are required to have a permit for the removal at that tree with certain exceptions. One would be generally if you live in a typical subdivision with a, a, a lot that's under one acre, you don't need to get a permit to remove a tree on your own private property if you occupy the house or own the house. Um, if you own a parcel that's greater than one acre or greater, there are exceptions if you are going to put an appurtenance on the house. Um, uh, if it's, um, Let's see, occupied family uh, less than or equal to one acre for the construction of accessories um, or to existing structures, or there's a nominal activity um, clause that we have uh, that you can remove three trees and less every six months. But the, the, I really can't stress enough though, please call us first because uh, it, everybody's aware now that the ordinance covers the whole city as opposed to the earlier ordinance which only required certain vacant par uh, properties and and there's we get a lot of calls by neighbors that um, are seeing trees removed that it's always best to get it ahead of time and get the permission ahead of time then try to catch up later the fall tree maintenance tree trimming program um 2020 to 21 2022 will be um uh, in the south central part of the city um we try to go, what this program is, is we try to have the city divided into seven areas. We try to make it through the city within seven years so that we're starting back again, um, back to square one. And what this is, is our city trees that are on the city right away, we prune 14 foot above the road and eight to 10 feet above the sidewalk if there is one. Tree, uh, trees that are not in a tree lawn, we tend to still, we wanna get that 14 feet there's, there's some subjectivity among certain residents on what they want on their side of the tree. Even though it's a right away tree, we try to uh, be respectful and try to trim it to what they want there within a certain reason. We try to explain to them though that removing some of these low branches early on um, is much better for the tree than to wait until that branch is a very large diameter, very large cut. Can we wait till the end there? Is there? Okay, thanks. Um, and, uh, we, while we're doing this, we're also looking for safe sight lines and block street signs and um, any trees that are hazardous. So, and there, we also, so we do try to do it in this rotation, but if you do have a tree that you would like trimmed, um, if it really needs a bad, we'll try to work it in. If it doesn't, I'll try to ask that you try to wait for us to get into that rotation because um, once we start doing those spot uh, trimmings, we get way behind. Um, and a note there, the adjacent property owner is responsible for removing their own encroachments that are growing into the road. We do tend to trim them. You'll get a notice that we're going to trim them if it's a private tree growing into the road. Um, so there's that. Uh, the city's, and this is where Matt was gonna come in here, but the city Phragmites program. Phragmites, in case anybody doesn't know, is a non-native invasive plant. I believe it came in through um, 
ballast water in the 1800s, and, and it is extremely aggressive and displaces native vegetation. It can affect property values and safety. It can grow into sight lines and the road right of way. The city um, assists residents and HOAs by securing needed permits. Um, finding qualified contractors and helping to coordinate the treatment. It's very easy to participate. And I know there's some subs HOAs in here that have done this. Um, you fill out a request for an estimate. There's no obligation for the quote. Um, you receive a cost estimate and then you decide if you want to treat or not. And then um, you pay the contractor and the treatment occurs fall, uh, summer or, or fall. And Matt was telling me that Almost every one of the HOAs that has participated in this program has returned to participate again. And a number of these subs that have called to participate again, when they do the free quote, the contract is going out there and seeing that the previous treatments were effective and no treatment was needed. So it is a very effective program. Um, can we, should we take a couple of questions or wait till the end? Because, okay, any questions? Well, if you live in a corner, it is um, at the point where the right-of-way lines meet. Um, this is easy if you have sidewalks, because normally it's the private edge of the sidewalk. You measure 25 feet on, on let's say it's north and 25 feet um, west, and then you draw a line, and anything in that corner is considered a sight distance issue. It's in a restricted corner clearance area. If it's um, in a street without a sidewalk, um, if you have a question about it, Seth in engineering would come out and measure it. And then if there is an issue, we, we, we go through a long process of contacting the homeowner. Probably the best thing to do is that my card is, um, is on the table there and we can, um, if, you, if you email me, I can get the answer. Fragmites? I don't think it includes removal. I think it just kills it. It's, oh, the cost is the cost is really variable. Um, if it's a big area and it's hard to get to, and they're going to need machines to spread wide swaths of the of the material, then it's much more costly than going in with a backpack and spraying a small patch, you know, in one ditch. Oh. Just to explain that real quick, what we're doing is, is essentially it all falls under one DEQ permit or EGLE now. So it, you know, it saves you that cost as well. And then you get sort of the bulk rate of, of being able to do that. So it really does depend on how much is in your pond or your retention area or what have you. And the contractor will come give you essentially a, a, uh, um, a cost estimate. So, okay. Real quick, I just, you know, we want to try and keep the, the meeting moving. So the specific stuff, let's save to the end. I promise there'll be some opportunity for, for Q&A there. Um, but if we get into the, the specific questions here, it's really going to delay things. We need to make sure we have time for everybody. So um, from our fire department, John Lyman is here. He's going to discuss recreational fires, home safety, and bed shakers. <clears throat> I always bring my own PowerPoint on paper so that if you have failure, you can go to it. So am I pointing at that or am I pointing? Okay, here we go. Uh, a couple reminders, the, um, especially for fall, there is no burning of leaves in the city. Uh, you can be ticketed. You can only burn seasoned hardwood, which is probably my next slide. Yeah, you can have recreational fires, but you cannot burn leaves in the city. Uh, for recreational fires, seasoned hardwood only, okay? And this is important to understand too. If you are burning for recreational fire in a UL, ETL approved device that you would buy at the local hardware store or online something, you do not need a permit. You do need a permit if you're burning in a uh, brick 
deal that you've made and it's on the ground. You do need a permit for that, okay? And we ask you to never use gasoline to light your recreational fires, okay? I've seen people do that and they, when we get there, there's no hair on their head. Bearded guy like you, uh, none. No eyebrows, nothing, okay? Oh, it's terrible. It's, it's awful. It's a trip to the burn center. All right. Um, as you decorate for the fall season, be sure your address is visible to us. Okay. Um, so many addresses are covered up. Uh, landscape, trees, uh, stuff we've kind of already talked about today can cover up your address. And all that does is delay response. Obviously, if it's on fire, we see smoke. But if you call for a medical or something else, and we can't find your address, it, it's, it's, it slows down our response time. All right, home safety surveys. So I've done probably close to 60 home safety surveys just this year. Uh, I can come out and, and conduct it for uh, your residents, and uh, there's no charge for that. I can install smoke alarms uh, and uh, CO alarms if I have them. Uh, we'll talk about cooking and other fire safety issues and we'll ch just check your smoke alarms, CO alarms also, okay? I did two today. Okay, this is something we have available and uh, I've taken advantage of this through the state of Michigan, the state fire marshal's office. I have a limited supply of three right now <laughs> in my office, but uh, for the deaf and hard of hearing, that little device there uh, is, a, is a clock. It's connected to a, uh, you see that black little like hockey puck, I call it a hockey puck. It is, that device goes under your mattress or under your pillow, usually it's under the mattress, and it's listening for your smoke alarm. If it hears a smoke alarm go off, it'll vibrate. For those that are deaf and those that are hard of hearing, they take the hearing aids out at night, they, they can't hear that high-pitched tone from your smoke alarms. Those are available free of charge. I have three in my office. If I need more, I can get some more. Um, I had five and I've given a couple out. So uh, those are awesome devices for, again, the deaf and, and hard of hearing. And I will attend any of your HOA meetings if you want to, dis if you want me to come in and, and talk about any fire topics, fire safety topics, um, you can send me an email or call me and there's my contact information. Okay, and I'm on, I'm on the city's website and would be glad to help out with that. I wrote down a couple things because a couple things came up with other groups. Let me just make sure I cover what I want to cover. Yeah. So as we get into winter months, clearing of snow around fire hydrants is very important to us. Okay, three foot. If you, if you can shovel out three foot around your hydrants, that saves us time in a house fire in, in hooking up our supply line to the hydrant. Um, so we would ask you to do that. And there was a question about staffing for plows and plowing. So I thought I would mention about staffing. Um, I don't know if you watched, but Channel 7 came to Station 4 and interviewed me, and we talked about staffing in the fire service uh, a few weeks ago, a couple, three weeks ago. And we have no open positions right now. Our, our fire department is uh, staffed uh, fully right now, again, with no open positions. So uh, we're quite, quite proud of that. There are departments that are struggling to get uh, firefighters and paramedics uh, into their stations. So. Uh, we are very fortunate there. Last thing I want to bring up is I brought some of these, a very limited number, but I've been giving out a, a ton of these file of lifes. And if you have medical history, or if you have residents in your HOAs that have significant medical history, you put this little pocket on your fridge, you fill this form out, this thing folds up nicely, fits in the pocket. Our firefighters know to look in, not look in your fridge, if they're looking in your fridge, they're probably looking for a Coca-Cola or a beer or something. But they are trained to look outside of your fridge on the door for one of these uh, pockets. So uh, I do have some of these. If you if you want to take a couple, that's fine. I've given out probably, probably 150 of those this year. So they are popping up more and more here in Rochester Hills. That is really all I had. Questions? Yes. Put it on the side, yeah, yeah, yeah. My, my uh, refrigerator doesn't go on the front either, yeah. 
All right. Thank you very much. From Oakland County Sheriff Department, we got Detective Mark Hickson here to talk about crime stats. Mark. I'm a little shorter again, so. Uh, Mark Hickson with the Sheriff's Office. Anybody here don't know who I am? He laughs because he's like, yeah, of course I know who you are, right? Uh, I am a deputy of the Sheriff's Office. I've been in Rochester Hills now since... No, I don't know. I'm going 25 years, uh, give or take. Uh, I spent a little time in Oakland Township, came back here. I do public relations. I do the same thing that Chief Lyman does. What? Firefighter Chief Lyman. Um, same idea. Um, I'll go out all, all their HOA meetings, things like that. Uh, on a reverse, I could be where you're at. I'm the HOA president of Hawthorne Hills, uh, and I don't, I don't know how many other president stuff I home. Are. So we've done all sorts of topics here. Uh, we've done target hardening your home. We've done crime stats before without graphs. We've done uh, I don't know, security awareness and things like that. So today we're just going to run through pretty quickly, uh, and then we'll ask some questions, or if you have some questions, and I'll hang around to the end too. So, top button, side one. So a little crime survey. What we did is I did the last um, year, and the, it, up until the one in, in the in the the last two or three slides, the last thirty days. So these are the number of incidents. So uh, I just hit the high ones. So the thirty-one at Walton and Adams. Uh, you're talking anything from a car accident at Walton Adams to um, a larceny from a vehicle to uh, you're looking at the Trader Joe's complex and the village. Um, so retail frauds, things like that. Uh, 34, and there's a number underneath there. It was a little bigger. It was 37. So Avon and Rochester, same idea, car accidents, uh, the strip mall that's there, uh, the Burger King, that little, that little section there. It didn't, it didn't break it down into, into actual ones. The lower one on the freeways are accidents on the freeways. We take accidents on freeways, uh, including M59, which is a obviously a state road, M59. Um, other jurisdictions don't do that. They You crash and they wait, and then set, and then they have MSP show up to do it because it's technically their road. Uh, we don't do that. We, we take those accidents there. We don't have people wait. So uh, the one down there at uh, Auburn, the 28 and below that was a much larger number. Um, that's the substation. So we get people walking in every single day um, at the substation making reports. So uh, the selected parade for the last year, uh, homicides graded zero. Uh, like I said, uh, being the HOA president, I live here. I live here for a reason. Uh, that's why I, I lived in downtown Rochester for 10 years. Now I live in Rochester Hills. Uh, sex crimes, eight to 10. This is the last year, right? So eight to 10. So you'd say it's all relative on numbers, right? Uh, that could be anything from when I say CSC, that could be uh, a touching or the, you know, the parent who touches or the grandparent or a, a somebody on the, on the street. We, do we have an actual, uh, you think sex crimes and you're thinking rape right away. That's not necessarily the case. These could be a, a domestic situation or something like that. A uh, robbery down 50%, right? That's good. Two to one, uh, again, relative. That's someone who just actually takes something from you. So, uh, aggravated assault down 32%, uh, again, 34 to 23. That's domestic, right? Uh, domestic assault is uh, the husband and wife, the thing at night. Um, we, go to, we go to our fair share of domestic assault. So uh, burglary down 40%, that's good. Uh, burglary is uh, bur the gas station. There, you're breaking into the gas station. The one we had where the deputy spotted the one at the, the Shell gas station breaking in at three o'clock in the morning. Uh, larceny uh, is, is one of our bigger ones. Larceny, we do that one, it's called LFA larceny from auto. Uh, and that's going on right now. If you didn't hear the one the other day, it was Burlington off of Salem which is up where Mark and I are at, um, it, it, it's, a, it's a preventable crime, right? Let's, let's say that. Um, in my car, I have three cars in my driveway right now. My wife's car, uh, who we just didn't put in the garage because there's stuff going on. I can't put my car in the driveway because I got a kayak and football stuff and whatever else and a couple bikes. Um, and then I have my company car that's out there. Every night when I go in, tonight when I leave, I got my company car, and I've got guns, knives, bazookas, and all sorts of fun stuff in there, right? I take it all out. It's gone, right? There's a toolbox, and I leave my vest in there. It's pretty heavy. I got a sheriff's office vest. So I guess if you open it up, you'd see that. Um, there's nothing in there. I can leave it unlocked. You get my sunglasses, you know, what, five bucks out of the ashtray thing where you throw a quarter in, and that's it. Uh, you might as well leave it unlocked, and you get the windows. My Jeep Compass, there's nothing in there. Uh, I just, there's, I, well, I take that back. I think there's a towel in the back. To, when I, so you're three o'clock in the morning. It's a crime of opportunity. Um, it, it, most of the time it's kids. Uh, I'm not going to pick on who everybody, uh, you're just, I, and then kids older might be 17, 18, 19, still a kid or not, or a young adult. Uh, it's just drive, you know, 
doing your flashlight and seeing what you can have. Um, it's just, it's there. It's always been there. Uh, Rochester is always, every, every municipality has it. Um, I did 14 years on midnights in Rochester Hills. Uh, as Chief said, the biggest one is numbers. Oh, my goodness, man. I'll, I'll branch off on that for like two seconds. Uh, you know, it's really cool uh, when you put uh, 3,389 all spelled out in nice little letters on the side of your – man, that's terrible. I mean, I'll be completely honest. I mean, you're, if I was the government entity that required one thing, it'd be like you got to put your numbers next to your door. You got to put your numbers here because it's so hard to find numbers. Uh, and when you got, you know, your, your, your uncle, your grandma, or your little kid choking on something on Thanksgiving, and we got to get there right away. Uh, they got to get there right away. It's hard to do. So that's the larceny. Larceny is the, is that particular one, uh, motor vehicle theft. I can explain that one really easy. Uh, so the challengers, you know, the chargers and the hellcats right now are a hot, hot thing. And what happened is, is the really, I mean, they're criminals, but they're not saying they're not smart individuals, right? Uh, a guy in a jail a long time ago, 30 years ago, he says to me, hey, deputy, you know when he said crime doesn't pay? I go, yeah. He goes, like, yeah, it does. You know, so what they've done now is they've got a handheld computer. They smash out the window of the car, and they can start the car from the computer with nothing. They don't, have to, they don't do nothing. They bought it off the Internet, and it's going like crazy. I don't know what Chrysler's going to end up doing, but you buy it off the Internet, and you just break the window out, start the car, and drive away. Um, are we going to chase a Hellcat car that goes, I don't know, uh, I'm sure it's well over 100, right? No, right? It's a property crime. You're just going to get hurt chasing someone in your property. Farmington Hills telling me on the other day, the guy's like, why didn't you chase them? Well, we're just not going to chase cars on a property crime. Yeah, that, that's the bottom line. Uh, weapons, that's a big one, right? Why is it up almost 77%? You know, that's just the area, right? I mean, people coming in for whatever reason, whether you're looking to get narcotics or whether you're coming in for you know, different areas. Are they people from Rochester Hills? I don't know. I didn't pull all the numbers to see where they came from specifically. But these are traffic stops. Um, and things like that where you have somebody in the city for whatever reason that are carrying weapons nowadays. Uh, uh, weapons to us, whether it's a knife, uh, whether it's a gun or whatever it might be. Um, but that's a significant increase. Again, if you go with numbers, you're like, okay, 23. Well, definitely there's 52 weeks in a year, so you got three shifts. You're pulling off less, one, less than one gun. Yeah, uh, true. Uh, but I don't want that to pull off one gun at all. You know, that's the reason why I lived in the city as it is. So um, The trend, uh, it stays the same. Is there... One of them is a little pointer, right? The middle one? There's a middle one? It works. All right. So that's that's the basic trend. It all stays the same. Uh, we do damage to properties like a, we call it MDOP, right? Someone going through a grass or something like that. Uh, family, friends, a drug. They're all kind of staying the same. Nothing really has gone up or down. And that's a good thing that you don't see any kind of sharp spike in any particular thing. All their offenses in here, and it doesn't matter what it is. Uh, an offense can be as much as uh, an accident, an alarm. Uh, everybody knows to register alarm in the city. Uh, you got to call Brittany. Uh, you, you just and people are like, I didn't know I need to register. We've been registering for like 10 years now. Um, on midnights, if I took a dozen calls, eight were alarms. If I'm taking an eight alarm, then alarm is not, and, uh, let me take that back. I took a dozen calls, eight were alarms. And in my 26 years now in law enforcement, I've gone to two alarms that were legitimate alarms, two. Uh, so if I'm not spending time in your neighborhood and I'm chasing alarms around, then I'm not stopping the people stealing stuff in your car. So it, we still get 2,000 alarms, easy, every every year. Uh, it's just crazy how many there are. So um, I put time of day in there. I thought, what the heck, why not? So 4 o'clock, I guess everybody gets home from work. Uh, maybe you find something. Uh, that seems to be our busiest time. Uh, and then the offenses by a day of the week, a little quieter on Sunday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, and it kind of goes from there. What I didn't put in there is, oddly enough, holidays. We get more, we are busier more on the holiday. Christmas is notorious, right? You're going to get a domestic every Christmas and every Thanksgiving because you have Uncle Joe come over and Uncle Fred and Aunt whatever, and you don't like them and they don't like you. And then, but you invited them because your mom or your aunt said you had to do it. And then there's everybody drinks and it goes bad and they don't like the phone. It, it just, it just, so I didn't even put it in there, but holidays are always, always busier. So, um, violent crime fences, this is just the last 30 days. And again, it's the simple assaults. It's the, it's the 13, the 25. It's, it's relative to um, the numbers. You can say, well, all right, you're only at 22 for larcenies from auto. And that's, I said, that's where the LFA came in. It's, if you haven't heard on the news, it's a big one. And they came across this little computer, and they're just stealing these cars. Left. They're stealing them right off the lot, right? They just cut the lock in the back of the dealership or the back of the lot. The last one they did that I read or like, that I, on our end was they actually go to, this is the lot before it even gets to the dealership. Right. So this is they just I mean, there's 100 cars. Right. So you just 
cut the back of the fence and you start the car up and drive away. So uh, some of the trends, it's kind of hard to see on that one. I did property crimes um, that were up a little bit. That's, that's the biggest one to trend the last 30 days. Um, and the property crime, again, is um, a damage to property or let's, let me think. It's all property. So there's a person and there's a property. Right? So property crime would be uh, retail fraud, right? So retail fraud is huge in Rochester, huge everywhere. If you weren't aware, people steal stuff from stores every single day. We're at Walmart, Meyer, doesn't matter every single day. Um, it's a little less now when they have, well, we'll see the trend, right? Back in 2008, 2009, when someone like the village and you couldn't hire anybody, they didn't want to hire anybody, but we're, we had the recession, right? They'd have one person working. Well, people go in there, steal stuff and leave, and that one person couldn't do much. And now they had two, three people. Well, now with the shortage, I can only imagine they're going to go back down. So I would assume that that a lot of the retail frauds are going to increase just because of the lack of people that are actually working there. So, And people understand, I mean, if you go into a, a into a, let's say you go at the village and you go into the children's place that used to be there, right? And, and you scoop a handful of stuff out and you leave out and there's one, I don't know, let's say 30-year-old person who has to work in there and they watch you take this stuff out. Well, they can't just chase you out and they're leaving the store and we tell them, you know, don't chase anyways. Again, it's a property crime, right? You don't want to get hurt over a property. It's, it's, a, it's a corporate store. So that's, that's part of the property crime, so. That one didn't make any sense. We're going to skip that one. Uh, crimes in the last 30 days. So that's what I did here was same concept of four, uh, but I broke it down to 30 days as opposed to a whole year. Um, so again, that's Avon, Rochester, DeQuinter. That right there is a lot of the substation accidents down here. Uh, where are we at? The village right up here. Uh, that's farther up. That is close. That's Rochester High. Uh, and back in, again, oh, I'm right, right about there. So that's up our neighborhood. These are all, uh, it just seems, I don't want to say a rash, right? That's a, a rough word, but LFAs. It's just take the stuff out of your car. My lieutenant today, is just a, it's just a preventable crime. So see, I talked, I didn't tell you I talk fast, but I, you know, I get it out there. So any questions? Go ahead. Oh, they sell them. Hey. Well, you, you, yeah. You can track them, but there's a point where, and I talked to the auto theft guys, yeah, you can, but it's not as exact as you might think it, as, uh, what's the, what's the, yeah, Lone Lojax there, that's kind of an old one. OnStar, right? Yeah, OnStar. Yeah, no, OnStar sounds like they're pretty cool, uh, but they're not as cool as they think they are. Um, because OnStar will say, like, yeah, there's a hit on a stolen car, and it's at Avon and Livernoy. Well, it was driving through Avon and Livernoy, you know. So one day I thought I had the big one. Some guy calls on the phone. I had it. He's like, I can see my car. I even brought it up on the, it's right. And it was at that little, uh, go north of the Veterans Memorial on the east side of the road. And I'm driving through this. I call Auto Theft. Man, we got a good one. The guy says right here. Auto oh, Theft's like, you don't have anything. They were, the car was driving by and it pinged when it went by. Sure enough, I sat, I sat there. I'm like, all right, no, I'm going to catch the bad guy, man. I want to sit there. And I sat there and nothing. And never, I go to work on Livernoy every day. And I pulled in there every day thinking, I'm going to catch that car. And it was never there. So it, I'm not trying to say it's not a useful tool, but tracking down things. And you could track it yourself. Yeah, I can find my son. I can track his, you know, his, it used to have a gizmo watch, right? That thing was really accurate. Then we've got him his own iPhone. It doesn't seem to be as accurate. But it just, if you get something that you pay a lot of money for, but the general ones, it's, it's kind of hard to do, so. They are, yeah. The doorbell ones? I do. Uh, I, I, I'm not, I'm not advertising one system over another. But I bought Blink off Amazon. Um, I got five cameras. They're all they're at my exterior doors or at my or in the garage, inside the garage, outside the garage, the downstairs, just the interiors. You have to get into, and then one on my cars. Uh, I only set it at night. Uh, it just it goes off on my phone. Um, I don't set it during the day. Uh, unless my son says, hey, are you watching me? I'm like, oh, yeah, I might be on or not. Um, that whole system all set up, man, you can set that system up for, I don't know, $150, $200, right? Not much at all. It's not monitored by anybody but me. I'm the only one. Uh, so yeah, you got to call the police. I'm calling myself or I'm running up or whatever it might be. Um, but, you know, you pay a lot of money for alarms, and I'm not knocking any alarm company. Um, but you pay them money for an alarm company and you pay them X number of dollars and they get on television, they say, and they fire department too, we, we monitor fire, we monitor, and we, we, we have an armed security coming your way or we'll send, they're not, do, they don't employ anybody. They're just calling John and I, that's all they're doing. You know, so it's like, and we don't go there, lights and sirens. 
right? So if, if right now John and I were going, we're not going to do this, but if we did, and we're break, we'll pick Mark because we're breaking into Mark's house, right? No he's home. We know Mark's not home. Why? Because he's here. So John and I are leaving in a few minutes to go to Mark's house. We'll be done. I mean, we're in and out of there in what? I don't know. Four minutes. I mean, we're not doing what we did in the pad. Nobody's going to steal a television anymore. You can go to Costco and buy one of those for $100, right? We're not going to steal a vacuum microwave. We're not going to do that stuff. We're going to get stuff that's really quick, right? Maybe a laptop or something. or yeah, Not even take an iPad or a MacBook because, again, you're going to get tracked by the MacBook, right? So we're looking for some money or coins or something like that, but it's four or five minutes. So I, the systems are great, but the, I could show you one that we have right now. It's a ring system, uh, and it's the guy who did the LFA. And I'm glad we have something that's good. But it's not like this fantastic, beautiful image. It's a grainy kind of a, a thing. So do I support cameras? Absolutely. Uh, we can get plenty of footage and plenty of pictures. Uh, but if you're going to do it, right, you, you, could, you could up it to the next level. Uh, my sister bought one from, I think, Costco. Uh, it records on a loop. She's got put on like, I don't know, 10 cameras for 24-7. It always runs. And it has good footage on it. Um, so it's not, it's not in any way bad. But, you know, if you're going to spend, you know, if you spend $20 on a lock, you get $20 with a lock. If you spend $20 on a camera system, same idea. So. so it helps the register alarm system for a couple different reasons. One, uh, your alarm goes off or goes off for a particular reason. Uh, we don't know why it's going off. I'll give you an example. Uh, the doctor's office years ago at Avon Livernoid, the balloon's bouncing up and down, right? So the alarm goes off at, let's say, 2 o'clock in the morning. And then we go there and we check the building at 2 o'clock morning. I used to, it was when nights and weekends came on a cell phone, so I'd wake somebody up, right? But let's say that the alarm wasn't registered. So the alarm would go off. And then I clear it. But I can't get in the building. The alarm's just going interior alarm. I have no contact information to get in there. 30 minutes later, I get an alarm again. I go by there again. We get that alarm five times in one night. Every night, I'm going to that alarm for five times with no contact information. What am I not doing? I'm not patrolling. So what we did, the city did, it's a city, that, it's a city ordinance, is you register, it's you. And then another contact, and then another contact. So we can get a hold of people who's supposed to be there who has a key holder. And we do it every year because people don't like the people that were there before, or you get divorced, or you, you don't, that person's not on your list there anymore, or they moved away, your kid moved to Iowa or whatever. So that's why it's every single year. Brittany's got it down now where you don't even have to, you just call her on a phone, and people are get all upset. And, and we, I, she gives them to me, and I talk to them because she doesn't want confrontation. So don't yell at Brittany. But I, I, I'll say, hey, yeah, you got to do it every single year, and here's why. Um, and and, and just, it's just, it's way, it's just, again, it's, to me, it benefits me as a citizen and you as citizens to kind of knock some of that down. So, All right, I'll hang around as long as we get done by 1130. So. All right, we're getting down to our, our last couple speakers here from our building department. We have Tim Hollis, Deputy Director. He's here to talk, uh, give a construction update, talk about solar and wind permits. Thank you, Dave. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out tonight. I'm going to share with you. There we go. Some construction updates. So as you are well aware, there's a lot of construction going on around Rochester Hills that continues. Uh, this gives you a comparison of uh, where we are this year as compared to last year. And you can see we are up 156% uh, in the residential new house permits. Um, this is actually from January to June. And you might say, well, COVID affected that number in 2020. Well, it, it did and it didn't because during the stay-at-home order, we continued to work uh, from home working on uh, getting permits ready to issue. So when that order was lifted, we issued uh, a bunch of permits at the same time. So we actually saw a, a really significant year last year in the residential construction as well as commercial. And we're gonna see, it looks like a banner year this year as well. Um, one of the things that you'll see, it, you know, you would think that COVID affected construction and how much is going on. It doesn't seem to have affected it like I thought it would. But what it has affected is the length of time it's taking to complete those projects because of, as you've heard, the material shortages, everything not being able to get where it is. And if you drive around town, you'll see houses that don't have siding on them. And that's part of the reason. They're, they're waiting for those materials to come. So, but the builders continue to move forward. Um, some of our major commercial projects ongoing, I uh, want to put a few up here. 
Rochester Hills Trio, that's the three buildings at the corner of uh, Livernois and uh, Auburn, the northeast corner. There's three buildings there that are under construction right now. Um, the Fairfield Inn, which uh, we're hearing they might try to open before the end of this year. Um, again, material issues. No one really knows when all these projects are going to get completed. Uh, Von Mar, they're starting to get some of their final inspections, but they've told us they may not open until next year. They've got, once they get their final inspections, they've got stock to bring in and things to set up and training to do and so forth. So I'm not sure that that's going to happen this year, probably more like next spring. Um, Legacy Apartments, you heard about that a little bit earlier. That's at the corner of, northeast corner of Hamlin and Adams. Uh, there are 10 buildings there, apartment buildings um, that are going in there. And it's a unique type of construction. If you drive down there, you'll see it's different than anything we've ever seen here in Rochester Hills because they're called tunnel form construction. They basically pour the walls and the floors all at one time in multiple units in the building on one day. Once it, it's fast curing concrete, once that concrete reaches a certain strength, typically by the middle of the next day, they're able to pull those forms, move over, set up to do the next pour. So that project's moving along pretty rapidly and uh, it's going pretty well. Um, Redwood Apartments, uh, that is over by Yates Cider Mill. You don't see any buildings going up yet. They're still in the land development phase. They're moving a lot of dirt and they'll be putting in their infrastructure and things like that. But that will probably be uh, They'll probably be getting permits and moving upward on that early next year, I, I expect. All right, so we had a couple of questions about solar and wind, and uh, hopefully you can see that. So I wanted to just touch on this. We're seeing a lot of uh, solar permits over the last couple of years. It seems to be a big thing right now. Um, and people talk about where can they be? Well, both ground mounted and roof mounted units are permitted in all zoning districts in the city. Uh, roof mounted uh, may, be, uh, may not protrude past the edge of the roof, may not extend more than four feet above the roof surface. Ground mounted uh, should not exceed 10 feet high at a maximum tilt. And building permit and electrical permit is required for both these applications. So we see a lot of solar. We're not seeing so much in the wind range yet, although our ordinance does permit it. Um, small residential wind energy systems are permitted in any zoning district as well. They can be roof mounted or tower mounted. They have to comply with city ordinances for height. And there's a lot of details with that, how far you are from other structures, how far you are from your property line and so forth. And again, a building permit and electrical permit is required for those as well. And that's really all I have, but I'll take questions. Yes, sir. No, they're allowed on any side of the roof, and they that's because depending on which way your house faces, that's when you're going to get the best, you know, exposure to the solar. So they, they don't have to be on the back. They can be on the front. Your subdivision, your associations can have multiple things in their bylaws that the city doesn't have the authority to enforce, but you certainly can have your own separate rules in place. Yes. No, no, usually it's the HOA can have their own and ordinances can't override those requirements. Um, yes, sir. So, so one of the things that when they come in with the permit for the solar, and usually it's these big solar companies, not usually a homeowner doing their own project, they have to provide us a engineer, a letter from an engineer saying that the roof is capable of withstanding the extra load. Usually these things aren't very heavy, okay, and they usually have multiple support points. Um, they go on a grid, depending on how many you have, so forth. Um, and so they do have to give us a letter saying that roof is capable of supporting it the way it's been designed, or they may say additional support is needed. Typically, most of the ones are we've seen don't need additional support, but it is certainly possible. But you know, we're not the experts in older roofs and things, so we have them give us a letter from an engineer telling us that. And I highly encourage if anybody's thinking about doing it, 
you know, if you have an older roof, you're probably gonna wanna have that roof redone before you do that because if your roof ages, you're gonna to have to pull all those off in order to replace your shingles and that type of thing, so. Yes, sir. Uh, they haven't told us yet right now, it's just a shell building and we don't have any permits yet for specific tenant. So until they actually give us the permit, we don't really know what their total plan is. Yeah. Yeah. And so one of the things when they want to develop something like that, they have to start with the planning commission and the planning department, and they handle all of that as to the parking, how it's going to affect the parking. And they may have to, they have to calculate, you know, how many spaces are going to lose. They may have to add some parking somewhere else, but that all starts in the planning stages before it ever gets to the building department for an actual permit application. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. And as a matter of fact, in a couple of weeks, I have a meeting scheduled with them to find out what their plan is to go for, you know, whether they're going forward this project or what they're going to do. So, yes, sir. So, well, um, I haven't been inside of myself lately. Mike Vizenko, our inspection manager, is here, but... Uh, they are getting inspections, they are working on, so you might not be seeing things happening on the outside, but there are things happening on the inside. Um, you know, their permit is valid as long as they continue to work. So there's really no deadline we're encouraging them to move forward. Uh, I think that they're moving as they raise the funds to, to complete it. But at least, you know, the outside is starting to look better. We're seeing progress that we didn't see in previous years. So we're happy with that. Okay, um, at this time I'm going to, okay, I'll let Dave introduce Jody. Yeah. You know, the, one, the one question that came up about um, homeowners rules override an ordinance, I just wanted to address that um, a little bit more specifically. So, you know, the, the ordinance is what the city enforces. You can be more specific with a rule, but say, you know, the city says, um, you know, you can have a, a six foot fence. Uh, the homeowners association can't say, well, you can have a seven foot fence. So it can't change what the ordinance is, but it could be more specific. You know, we don't allow fences in our homeowners association. So hopefully that clarifies that a little bit. So um, our last speaker, most anticipated, um, is our, uh, our ordin one of our ordinance inspectors, uh, Jody Welsh. I feel like I should have a stool. All right. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, as you know, there have been quite a few changes in our ordinance department over the last six months or so. Um, I just want to let you know we are still very committed to keeping up um, with the values of the city of Rochester Hills. We do appreciate all the work you guys do as, as our HOAs, um, the initial leads, the information, uh, contacting us. Uh, we appreciate all that and that we just want to let you know we are definitely here as a resource to help guide you, assist you as anything that you may need. Uh, just some of our common questions that have come in. Um, so leaves and fall cleanup. So leaves and yard waste can't be placed in plastic bags at the side of the road. They will not be able to be picked up. Acceptable containers are your typical brown paper yard waste bags you can pick up at any store. Um, or a 35 gallon trash container. It just has to be marked that it contains compost or yard waste in it. And our yard waste is collected through our contract until the second week of December. Seasonal decorations. We are moving into this time of year when everyone gets excited and starts putting out things in their yards and on their porches and stuff. Um, people can get very creative and just want to let you know that tastes can vary between neighbors and that we don't enforce um, any seasonal decorations. Special pickup of Christmas trees. 
Um, any discarded Christmas trees will be collected by GFL during the Chris beginning Christmas week and the following three weeks. Trees can also be dropped off in the parking lot at the Clinton River Watershed Council for free recycling by the city. More information about that program will be released at the beginning of December from our Natural Resources Department. And please know that any trees, whether they're dropped off at the Clinton River Watershed or picked up by GFL, need to have all the decorations, lights, everything removed. It can only be the tree itself. And for snow clearing, um, snow is coming. We do have an ordinance that requires all of our interior subdivision sidewalks to be cleared of snow and ice within 48 hours after the snow event and remain cleared. We, this is intended to help prevent slip and falls from people that are walking in the neighborhood, children heading to the school buses and the schools themselves. Some tips for this, please just make sure that, that to shovel the snow off the sidewalk on your property and not into the street. There is an ordinance and a state law not allowing snow cleared from your property to be pushed onto the street or across the street. You tend to see a lot of um, snow plows that will take it right out of your driveway and push it right across the street to a neighboring property. Um, also, please clear the snow to the curbs so that your collection crews can access your trash and recycling bins. Um, make sure it's a nice clear area so they're not tipped, they're not angled over, and that way our, our GFL um, guys can come pick that up for you. And that is it. Does anyone have any general questions? Anything specific for you, your HOA, your neighborhood? I'll be happy to take after. six actually thank you thank you thank you <laughs> okay <laughs> um, the question is is there a way that we can be recycling our hazardous waste in a more convenient um, way. And I'm actually going to defer that to Dave. Um, Scott. Hi, my name's Scott uh, Cope. I'm the director of the building department. Uh, I guess I'd ask uh, for a little clarification. What, what I know that's, that's a good uh, question and something that we, uh, uh, could look into and, and see right now you have to take them to, to different locations. We used to have the NOHAS program we were involved in and uh, that gave you several uh, locations throughout the year that you could go to and that now we have uh, uh, gotten out of that program because uh, we have the ability to take it to a different location and, and I know it's not convenient. I, I understand that. Yeah, as far as the working with GFL, they don't get into that, uh, the hazardous material portion of things, so they wouldn't have that ability to do that because it's a whole different uh, operation and, and location where things are taken. Uh, so that would be something that we'd have to look into in another way. And, and I appreciate your question because that's something that uh, as we consider how we move forward, um, we can look into that and see if there is another option that we could look into and, and possibly offer in the future. But at this point, I, I apologize, that's all we have is, is what we've worked out, so. Uh, that's a good question. I guess we could ask uh, GFL and find out uh, what they do. I know uh, the way that they dump them, I don't know that they're really gonna see them. You see, you see how they lift it up and just dump it in there, so uh, chances are there's Probably some people they're putting it in there and it's it's just get taken away. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're working on the honor system there when it comes to that. I don't know that there's too much that they're gonna look at. They don't really look inside the, the trash before they dump it, so
So that that concludes our uh, all the presenters that we had today. I, I tried to include um, we, we, when we sent out the email points of interest that any of you had. So that does help. You know, we obviously do this twice a year. So if things come up that you're interested in that you would like us to talk about or you'd like additional information that we can present um, at these HOA meetings, just think about that. That does help us to set up, um, you know, the topics that we, we speak on. So it, it's uh, on point for what you're looking for. Um, before we conclude and, and have an opportunity for some individual Q&A, uh, Dave Hill is the president of Heatherwood Homeowners Association. He's in the back of the room here. And he is interested in sharing resources and thoughts on how um, HOAs have addressed different types of issues and how those uh, maybe sharing information and, and resources about how you can resolve some of those issues. So if you're interested in sharing that, um, Dave asked that I point that out so you can speak to him. But uh, every, all the other presenters who are here were uh, available to you. And if you have specific questions and things that you want to talk about, we'd be happy to do that with you. So thank you for coming tonight.